Synanon is a real corporation. Its business is junkies. <laughs> Chuck Diedrich is the ex-drunk who dreamed it up and fights to keep it from becoming a nightmare. Nice. Get out of that car and shut up. Stand over there. Put your hands against the wall. Get in that cell and stay there. But nobody tells me what to do. No, by <laughs> then, <laughs> what the ex-con with the killer's fist tends <laughs> so tight for a fix they bleed. Look, Betty, I don't make scenes with chicks because I've got other things on my mind. Yeah. Johnny. Wow. Doll face with a deadly, expensive appetite. What are you, my nurse? No, just another dope fan. Just another dope fan. Zanky. A hip hop head. Up from the gutter to grab anything he could. Cool. Do. Yeah. And Zanky doesn't make it, by the way. Yeah, Zanky's not going anywhere. <laughs> wow, you can almost hear the big fat tie and suspenders. No, it's cool, because again, talk about a movie that at least everybody who's in it looks horrible. Do they? <laughs> you know, there's a not Earth cool. Kid. Well, no, the guy not Earth, not Earth, Earth kid. kid looks great. Yeah. But Chuck Dieterich is like played by it's so nice to have him not played by like Joaquin Phoenix. Oh, I know. <laughs> like it's just like a fat, ugly guy playing yeah. a fat, ugly guy. It's relevatory. Yeah. I mean, I loved, uh, I loved the dude who played Penguin. He did a great job. But they oh, could have, they could have. Danny just... DeVito. You no, know, Colin Farrell. Colin Farrell. Oh, that's right. They could yeah. also just hire hire an ugly actor every now and again. It's hard, man. Ugly yeah. actors. Uh, are to fucking, be honest, a lot of times you, they're guilty of crimes. The person who should have played <laughs> yeah. the Penguin, who truly seems evil, judging by all of his stories, is Joey Diaz. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Technically, yes, he is guilty. Yeah. Of kidnapping. Yeah, you think about the ugly actors that would be good at playing Penguin that's also a criminal. Jeffrey Jones. Jeffrey Jones oh, as well. Actual criminals actual should criminal. play. Yeah, he's exactly. A, he's the Hire principal. criminals to play criminals, please. <laughs> Representation. <laughs> Fantastic. Now, within 10 years of its founding, right around the time that the Synanon movie was released in theaters, Chuck Diedrich's unlicensed rehab startup had 1,100 members and was getting $2.5 million a year in donations. Yeah. Wow. It owns $7 million in real estate in five states. It had its own merch business, and it ran a number of gas stations. He learned that from Scientology, is that you buy in real estate. Yeah. He actually is a better, better businessman than all of Adult Swim. Yeah. They, <laughs> yep, they yes. actually have merch. Yep. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's the thing. You say sci he learned it from Scientology. I don't think he did because yeah. Scientology and Synanon ran parallel to each other. Maybe it's because he were... was an executive already. He had started as working for, he was working for a big corporation and then he just understood like, oh, I just use that structure. Yeah. I think he's just smart. You yeah. Know, like there's some, a good idea is a good idea. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Now, partly, Synanon had gotten so cash rich because it had opened its ranks to non-addicts in the late 60s because Diedrich figured that anyone could benefit from the game and- not addicts they got a lot more money than drug addicts. You got one foot shorter than the other. You got one leg shorter than the other. You we're going to have to tug on that leg. <laughs> yeah, we're <laughs> Allegorically. I just feel like if you don't have a problem, why would you go to this? <laughs> it's Well, it's because, again, we're going to get into it. It's about building and understanding community. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, these non -addict, well, these non-addict Synanon members were called squares. And once they joined, Chuck Diedrich realized that people shouldn't, quote-unquote, graduate from Synanon mm -hmm. anymore. Oh. Used to be you could graduate from Synanon. Yeah, they Go form supposed, your own. Be be a seed in the world. It was supposed to correct you and help you and then right. release you. But then he is just like he realized uh -oh. what was the quote? He realized that um, uh, you can't graduate a religion. Yeah. But he's not quite to that point. No, yet. but we'll get there. Well, yeah. that's the beginning of a cult. Yeah. Well, okay. he realizes at this point that Synanon can become a lifelong commitment. Why let people go? Yeah, well, this is like what happens when they allow you to graduate with a master's in sociology and your only profession is being a teacher. Mm. Yeah, that's hard. Now, yeah. predictably, once Synanon became a long-term thing and more people with money joined, Chuck Diedrich began building compounds. And uh -oh. by 1971, and this is what I'm talking about, the largest cult you've never heard of, almost 2,000 people lived in Synanon facilities, mostly here in California. Wow. Yeah. Um, good, thing Janet, good thing Janet Reno wasn't around then. <laughs> she would have had a, a field day killing all of them. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, consequently, Chuck Diedrich and Synanon became more controlling and militant in the late 60s and early 70s. In 1971, for example, Diedrich tried putting some uppity dope fiends in their place with an act that was later called the Dirty Double Dozen. <laughs> oh, baby. It's really good I've the seen names. that. <laughs> Dirty Double Dozen. Oh, man, that sounds like a great, like, 
Uh, it sounds like a great donut shop. Port. Sounds oh, like a- I, thought, I was just all I heard was bukkake. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's all of I there. saw in my head was I just, bukkake. I just thought are like really unhealthy donuts. Yeah, I, I like see really good donuts. This difference between us. I gotta, <laughs> I gotta take a break. I could see that being like a special every Thursday at Burger King, the Dirty Double Dozen. Oh yeah, yeah, I could see that. Yeah, so burgers, donuts, come. <laughs> <laughs> that's <laughs> about the show. <laughs> yep, that's it. That's the show. That nails it. Well, after ordering 22 dope fiend old timers and two young squares onto a Synanon bus, they dubbed the Cine Cruiser. Mm-hmm. That's cool, honestly. <laughs> also, that's was, actually it cool. It was a Greyhound bus that they bought. It's like, that's the Cine Cruiser. That's oh, sweet, though. Paul Morantz also hits it a lot with the term Jitney. Jitney? He kept calling it a Jitney. Okay. And then actually, Chuck Dieterich went as far as to say is that the bus, the Cine Cruiser, was the second most important element. Of Synanon, other than him. <laughs> he wow. loved his bus. So L. Ron Hubbard had the cr- sea had the craft, had yeah. the boat, and he's got the Cine Cruiser. He's got the Cine Cruiser. Okay. But, but the Cine Cruiser is very uh, necessary yeah. because their two biggest um, their two biggest compounds are in Santa Monica and in Marin County. Like right it's north pretty of San far Francisco. Away. Yeah. So, you know, they're like about 400 miles apart from each other. Yeah, it's like five and a half hour drive. Yeah. You're putting that on a bus. Zip, zip, zip. Back oh, on. man. Mm-hmm. Being on a bus with a bunch of people who are recovering drug addicts. I mean, it is just a Greyhound. We were singing songs. Yeah. But that's the thing is that they actually know total silence on this trip. Oh, hey, yeah. My God. Total what a nightmare. silence from Santa Monica to Marin County. Wow. Actually, maybe that's best. Chuck, in a way, uh, he has his own sense of humor Mm -hmm. about how he's the godhead of this group. Yeah. Okay. They began running drills in which all (laughs) residents had to stop what they were doing when they heard the words, hey, Rube. Hey, Rube. Hey, Rube. I would love to see them run drills. That would be amazing. In the (laughs) army now, dude. A bunch of jazz musicians trying to figure (laughs) out how to be an army. (laughs) They then had to grab anything they could that could be used as a weapon and come running. That's my uh, dick, dude. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and like Charles Manson, Diedrich became convinced that a race war was coming. Yes, right. no, it was well. He called it a holy war. A holy war. But oh, it was I the, see. The subtit- well, the thing is that Synanon was actually integrated uh, at a time when. So what's the races that are going to be fighting? The uh, other ones outside of Synanon. No, oh, it's okay. everyone in Synanon is going to be cool with each other, but outside it's going to be black versus white. It's the same oh. thing. It's, it's helter skelter. Great. Yeah, basically. Yeah. It's going to work out fantastic. Yeah, yeah. And as such, Synanon members began reacting not only to actual attacks, but to anticipated assaults. Yeah, yeah, he's like, he's ramping it up, saying they're coming to get us. It's that. It's the same Jim Jones yeah. cycle. Yeah. You got to have that fear, I guess. One former member named Phil Ritter was almost beaten to death by two so-called Imperial Marines in his own driveway. His skull was broken and he was in a coma for a week. Hmm. But that wasn't meant to be a murder. Synanon's next major act of violence, one of the weirdest in cult history, was in 1978, an attorney named Paul Morantz that Henry has mentioned a couple of times already. Mm -hmm. He became involved with a case in which a woman with mental health problems was referred to Synanon. Without asking her what she wanted, Synanon whisked her away to a facility hundreds of miles away, shaved her head, Hmm. and held her there against her will. She probably didn't want that. No. 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 All of this was illegal. It took nine days for her husband to find her, and the man who assisted him was Paul Morantz. Mm. Now, Paul Morantz caused a lot of trouble for Synanon, especially because his actions triggered charges of kidnapping, wrongful imprisonment, and practicing medicine without a license. Those were all crimes he was actively doing. Yeah, it was. And also, yeah. and because she was mentally ill, she wasn't an addict. That's how they got the practicing medicine without a license. I there. think sitting on me have caused their own problems. And oh, this yeah, guy yeah, was just sort of like did. exposed <laughs> him, maybe. Yeah. But therefore, Chuck Diedrich began to see Paul Morantz as a mortal threat to everything he'd built. Uh-oh. Now, Morantz knew that Diedrich was a dangerous man because he'd heard about the severe beatings and threatening phone calls from Synanon members didn't help matters either. Eventually, Morantz bought a shotgun and started checking his car for bombs every time he got in. Jeez. And as it turned out, Morantz's instincts were correct. Because everyone thought for a while that he was crazy. Yeah. They were like, they're just a group of kooks. This is just a thing. There's like a fad they're or whatever. Gonna... They're not going to do anything. But he was like, I think this guy's going to kill me. Yeah. I mean, the idea of a car bomb, it's uh, unique. 
I mean, it happened. Be like, really? You think they're going to use a car bomb to kill you? It definitely yeah. used to happen way more than it used to. I feel like way. car bombs were used to, were like, I know that car bombs were used a lot in the Italian mafia, uh, in the Neo-Nazis. the Troubles, in the Nazi, in, yeah. in the, the Troubles in mm-hmm. Ireland. Yeah. There's a lot of car bombs. So good stuff. It's, eat, it is, eat, you go through the drive through at Taco Bell, you got some friends in the car, next thing you know, you got car bombs. <laughs> now that <laughs> is old-fashioned humor. That's good humor. <laughs> yeah, it's very good humor. I'm going to call you the good humor. Yeah, yeah. yeah they call me the poopy chill. <laughs> That's bad. Yes, indeed. Well, one night in October of 1977, Morant said he was just going to go home, sit down, watch the World Series, and not think about Synanon for one goddamn second. Man, Mr. Morant, that's a lot of detail. Uh, yeah. All right, usually yep. just say goodnight. <laughs> <laughs> one goddamn second. One goddamn second. <laughs> but before he could do that, he had to check his mail. Uh-oh. Now, he didn't have his glasses on that night. But through the grill of his mailbox, he said he could see the outline of an unusually shaped package. Oh, look at that. Somebody sent my slinkies. Yeah. Oh, yeah, wow. And when he opened the mailbox, he found a four and a half foot long rattlesnake with the rattle removed. Oh, yeah, dude. The well, th- is it poisonous then still? Oh, God. Yeah, Ooh, the, snake, the rattle isn't in the... Fu- what? The rattle's what, what? keeps this the snake away from you. <laughs> what do you... The what? rattle's there to... I'm be- sorry, I'm a fucking know. snake expert. <laughs> <laughs> this is the least of our troubles. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> of things that he's gotten incorrect. This is the very least <laughs> of this. I got like, uh, it's like, it's like, it's like technically you can, he was you correct can about up. the bees last yeah. week, so this I am so usually correct. You can tell the things I've got incorrect the amount of times a clock is broken. The, poo- the corn and the poop story. The clocks. No, you corn and poop. The, um, corn is in poop. No, your g- allegorical tale uh, that you said a long time ago. Um, uh, and the clocks yeah, so, actually holds up. I've had people DM list. me and tell me that that was true. That's because they're just trying to fuck you. <laughs> no, man. They're just trying to have I've sex been with you told that that's kind of smart. They actually said, I got a DM saying that's kind of smart, actually. That's kind of smart. Just actually. looking for money. <laughs> they're, just looking for, they're trying to get involved in your life. <laughs> 